I want to be baptized. We send us, you know, son, uh, we, we appreciate how much you love the Lord, and one of these days we really want you to be baptized. Well, he would say, what do, what do I need to know to be baptized? And we said, well, uh, there'll come a point where, uh, uh, where you know the Lord and you love the Lord in a, in a way just like Jessica has, and it'll be a wonderful experience. And he said, uh, but I love God. And I, I want to be baptized. And so all, all week long, uh, uh, yeah, even at bath times, he would, he would act out the baptism. And he thought about it, and he, and he, and he played, and he dreamed. It was, what a wonderful experience it was. And the next week, he noticed that Jessica took the communion. She had never done that before. Just mom and dad took the communion. And he leaned over during the communion. Uh, he said, uh, why is Jessica taking of the cracker and the grape juice? And, uh, and Janine said, his mom said, uh, well, now that she's baptized, she's a child of God, and she, sh she loves God, and she shares in this experience. Uh, and while she's taking of that Lord's Supper, she's thinking about Jesus. He thought about that a long time. The next week, as the Lord's Supper came around, uh, he just quietly leaned over to mom, and he said, you know, we're all doing it. And Janine thought, and she said, say that again. And she said, he said, well, you know, we're all doing it. And Janine said, I don't understand, Jay. Tell me what you mean we're all doing it. He says, well, those of you who are baptized are thinking about Jesus, and those of us that are not baptized, we're thinking about Jesus too. And we thought, what a, what a wonderful theology. How, how, what a marvelous experience that was to, to share in the, in the joy of that discovery. And so every week he doesn't take of the communion, but he spends some special moments and times thinking about Jesus. I look forward to the time that, uh, that he will be himself baptized, that he will share in that marvelous experience. But I also know that there are many things that are working against him and against his sister's. I've, uh, I've seen different statistics, but the statistics run generally like this, that between 50 and 80 percent of the children who grow up in churches of Christ are not a member of the church by the time they're 30. The most conservative statistic is 50%. Half of our children, by the time they are 30, are not involved, at least within Churches of Christ, and many of them are not involved in any kind of Christian walk remotely related. Many of them, by the time that they're 25 or 30, are complete non-believers. I shared last night some of my great concerns about passing on the stories and, and, and the family uh, uh, spirituality. Because our children, they will be children of the promise. Uh, just because they are involved in Sunday school and just because mom and dad go to church does not mean they are going to be children of the promise. More than that, and this statistic, uh, it won't be a statistic, this perception uh, is as painful to me as the fact that many of our children are not involved at all in the Lord's church when they grow older. Many of those who stay in the church as, as adults are just nominal Christians. Dare I say it? Much like their parents. They just go to church, and that's really all that it is. I mean, they believe certain things, and they do certain things, and they are, after all, with us in the assembly week after week. But in terms of a vibrant, sacrificial, discipling kind of life, in terms of living life distinctively from the world, in terms of lives that, that, that are, uh, are given over in every activity to the Lord in, in a dynamic and aggressive way, uh, then that's just not the case. I have parents who often will say or ask me as, as, uh, as they know that I may be teaching their children in um, a freshman Bible class or an upper graduate, uh, upper level uh, undergraduate class. They'll say to me, 
Um, is, uh, is John faithful? You know what they mean by that, don't you? Is John going to church? John going to church anywhere? If being faithful means going to church every week, something is drastically wrong. Oh, I want them to go to church every week. Don't, don't get me wrong. I desperately want them to go to church every week. I, there is no way that they can be a part of the kingdom as, as individuals. They're a part of the kingdom only in relation to a larger community. But to say that simply because little Johnny is going to church every week that he is therefore a faithful steward of what God has given him and is living a faithful life is a gigantic leap, then I'm not sure that we can make. I'm not sure that faithful is the same as going to church every week. It is something more than that. For many, faith is simply faith in the tradition. Faith is faith in their parents' faith. Faith is something that, uh, uh, that we do because it's the right thing or the appropriate thing or because I'd be scared not to do the things that I'm doing. But that's different than saying that our children have a faith of their own. Will our children have faith? Walter Brueggemann expresses it differently. He says, the question is not so much will our children have faith, but will our faith have children? That's different. Will our faith be dynamic enough? Will our faith be overt enough? Will our faith be sacrificial enough? Will our faith be lived enough that our faith will have children? That, that in the church will, will our children and our children's children have faith? That, that is a very serious and significant question. I, I shared with uh, the congregation last night uh, that, that uh, the churches of Christ are in a period of great transition. And as, as all kinds of things are up in the air and changing and questions being re-asked, what... Where will our children have faith? Will they have faith in, in certain doctrines? Will they have faith in certain people? Or will they have faith in a living Christ that, that will perpetuate a, a dynamic living in the world that is to come? What kind of faith would our children have? Frankly, I want my kids to have a greater faith than what my faith is. I want my kids to be more sacrificial than me. I want my kids to be less selfish than me. I want my kids to be less prideful than what my faith is. I, I want my children to have more than my faith. I want my children to have their faith. Will our children have faith as they become adults? I think it is a serious question. What I want to do this week is to describe, first of all, the world in which we live that makes it difficult for any of us to have faith. And secondly, to describe what I would consider counterfeits to faith, things that pass off as faith but are not real faith at all. Things that, that in the long run prevent our children from having a deep and active faith. Then we'll look at some, some biblical models Old Testament and New, of what it's like for a community of believers to, to instill in their children a life of faith. And then, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, for the last half of the period tomorrow and for all of uh, uh, Friday, I want to be as specific and practical as I can on passing on our faith to our children. I want to talk, for example, about the role of fathers. I know less about what it means to be a mother, and that, that's part of why I will address so much to fathers, but I also think that, that many of the reasons why our children are not uh, sacrificially, aggressively, faithfully Christian in their adult life is because of our fathers. And I want to say some things about fathers, and I want to talk about church traditions and family traditions uh, and, and a variety of very specific things. Let me read as a, as a backdrop, uh, again, some passages that we touched on uh, in the assembly last night just to remind us of uh, the importance of passing on our faith to our children. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, the passage that we began with last night, starting in verse 9, in the context of, uh, of, of Moses uh, instilling in his people what it will take for them to be faithful in the land. 
Deuteronomy 4, 9, Be careful, he says, watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and their children after them. Teach them in such a way that it will be passed on to the coming generations. Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, and then the story is told. This is how you pass on the story, the telling of the story. Or in, uh, in chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 4, probably the most familiar passage in this light, the, the Shema of, uh, of Israel. Hear, O Lord, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your being, with an empowering kind of faithfulness. And these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up and tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that every living moment they will experience something of your faithfulness. If your children will ever have faith in this world, we'll look at, at the Old Testament, New Testament models of that tomorrow. What I want us to recognize, however, today is that it is very difficult in the world in which we live for, for any of us grown I am not sure that in the church we have seen as clearly as we need to see that we are engaged in a very significant spiritual battle for our very souls. I am not sure that we have seen how much at odds the values of the Christian community are with the values of the world. I mean, I think that we know it at some level, I think, but in terms of, of recognizing uh, the dangers of the world in which we live and doing everything within our power to live as Christians and Christian families and perpetuating our faith in a very difficult world, I'm not sure that we've recognized it clearly. And I say that because in too many ways the church looks like the world. We watch what the world watches. We read what the world reads. We speak as the world speaks. We dress as the world dresses. Our values are largely the values of, of the world. Uh, we are caught up many of us in the American dream. And the American dream is not, is not the dream of God. I love America. It's a wonderful country. I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this country. But, but the American dream is not the dream of God. And when, when we live our lives pretty much as, as both Americans and Christians and, 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 uh, uh, and, and kind of follow the values of both, we lose the values of Christ. To a large extent, we we are part of a counterculture. That's not anti-American. It is simply to say that the values of the other of this world, and as long as we are living pretty much at a level of comfort with the values of this world, our children will grow up to be secular Americans more than they will be godly, faithful. Christians. I have seen it in my own experience. I have seen it in my own life. I've seen it among my friends. And I see it among my children's friends. Let me share just three or four things that I think make up the, 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 the fundamental value. Uh, number one, the American value system is a value system that's concerned greatly about its standard of living, about its achievements, about its status, about who it is, who I am in relation to others. Uh, we are very comparative and we are very competitive in relation to others, uh, to other people on a whole variety of issues. And at the heart of that is how much money we have and how much money we can exhibit and the kind of clothes that we wear and the kinds of, 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 uh, uh, of, of lives that we, that we lead that tell others what our position is. We are an extraordinarily materialistic society. And, and I am convinced increasingly that as the churches of Christ have moved from the rural, primarily rural settings to the urban settings to the suburban settings, that we have been caught up in those same goals and ideals. That's not to blame suburban churches. It is to say that, that we are caught up in some of those same pursuits that our pursuits too often have to do with, with 
uh, we're sacrificing a whole variety of things to live in nicer homes and drive nicer cars and to, and, and to perpetuate in our family the pursuit of things. Owning things and have enough sacrificial giving in relation to the poor in society. And my, my guess is, is that for most of us in the church, this is a self-indictment. This is not just an indictment against the brotherhood at large that we spend far more money on our homes and ourselves and our decorations and our furniture and our clothes and our cars than we ever do to the poor. Spend very little money on the poor, the people who desperately need it in this world, but we do spend a lot on ourselves. It's no wonder that as our children grow older that they have very little concern for the poor and the oppressed and the outcasts in society. And then we can drive by neighborhoods of desperately poor and it never connect that, that there are people that the Lord wants and needs to touch in his name there. We just drive on to our next appointment and do our own thing. I have a friend who teaches at the University of Texas who says that he teaches, as he teaches these, uh, these college students, that the, the prevailing question hanging over these college students is, should I get an engineering degree so that I can make big bucks, or should I bite the bullet, borrow some money, and go to law school so that eventually I can make bigger bucks? All right. The issue is not engineering or law. Those are both honorable professions. But an example of the kind of decisions that our, that our kids as they grow older are making. What vocation can I be a part of that will make me the most money? Where do they learn that? From us. Somehow. From society in general. Our, our pursuit over things, over standard of living, over materialism and wealth. Secondly, I would suggest that this is a society that is consumed with a pursuit of happiness. And not only that, but feels like that it has a right to be happy. I'm not opposed to happiness. But I'm not sure, as the world finds it, that God is anywhere near as concerned about happiness as we are. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Happiness has to do with what is happening around us. Those words come from the same root. Happiness, happening. And, and in our context, in our culture, our happiness is largely determined by our circumstances, about, about what's happening. And so our desire is to create our circumstances in such a way that we, if we are not happy, what is our choice? What is our alternative? What do you do? You change your circumstances. Is that right? And in this society, everything can be changed. You don't like your hair color? Well, you change your hair color. It's all right. Happens all the time. Uh, if, if you don't like a job, you can change it. Now, that's, that's not true in every culture, but in our culture, if you don't like a job, you can change job. If you don't like the city that you live in, you just move. If you don't like the home you live in, you, you move. You go to another part of town, another neighborhood. We do it all the time. I am uh, a close friend of uh, a counselor, a psychologist, who is counseling a person who was changing his sex. I don't know what or her. Uh, he has had the surgery that will allow the him to become a her. Uh, if you don't like what you are, you can change it. If you're not happy with your wife, just divorce her. Get you another. You see how easy it all is? This is a society that is consumed with happiness. I have a right to be happy. If I'm not happy in this situation, I'll just get me another. The irony is, is as we keep changing circumstances, we're not any happier. 
But we keep looking for it and, and seeking it, and there is this sense that if we just work our circumstances right, if we can just live in the right place and wear the right clothes and have the right hair color and be the right sex and have the right spouse, go to the right church, do the right things, we'll be happy. God never promised us that kind of happiness, but we, I fear, perpetuate that kind of thing with our kids and because we want them to be happy too. Now, let me, let me give you the, the alternative to that. I'm not suggesting that, that we should want our kids to be miserable or that we should live a miserable existence so that we can't change some things that we don't like. Of course we can and should. But there is a difference between societal views of happiness and God's view of contentment in any and every situation. Those are radically different things. And I'm not sure that we, we are providing an atmosphere in which our children are learning to be content because we're always encouraging them to be happy and finding ways that we can make them happy. And if we don't think that they're happy, then we do all kinds of things to make them happy. And we build sometimes, some of us, a whole world around them to try to make them happy. Be happy. Are you happy? And I want my kids to be happy, but more than that, I want my kids to find a deep, eternal, abiding joy and contentment in their lives. Even if mom and dad don't live in the nicest of houses and we're a little embarrassed about the car that we drive and, 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 and wish that things were different, there is something that is so far beyond that. When our kids understand that we're living in a, in, in a different kind of world with different kinds of values than the world at large, they will find and can find significant contentment, godly contentment here. Thirdly, the world in which we live is a world that's filled with just sheer indifference. Sheer indifference. You're just not concerned about much. Um, we're not concerned enough about national issues that many of us vote. We're not concerned enough about local issues that any of us really get involved. Now, we, we complain and spout off about some things, but we are not terribly involved. And for many of us, it's the same with the church. We don't like the way things are going, so we, we go home and we just kind of talk about it, complain about it over lunch but are not aggressively involved enough in anything to affect it from the inside out. Jürgen Moltmann says that man's resignation, inertia, and melancholy. Temptation consists not so much in the titanic desire to be as God, but in weakness, timidity, weariness, and not wanting to be what God requires of us. There's a sense of resignation that, well, there's not much we can do about it anyway, so I'm just going to go on about my things, about my affairs. Uh, people are dying of hunger within three miles of my house, and I can live for months and years without ever noticing. We can drive right through downtown Portland and never even see the homeless. That's not the only issue. It's the issue that's on my mind today. But in a whole variety of ways, we just, we're just, you know, just pretty indifferent. I'll take care of my life. You take care of yours. I do my thing. You do yours. Uh, in that light, we, we don't even know the people around us much. Uh, we, we don't know the names of the people who live in our neighborhood. Back in, and th these are not the golden years, I don't mean it that way, but, but there was a time back when when things were more rural than they are urban, that even though people lived farther apart, they knew each other more. than now that we're all crowded in our cities and we don't even know the names of our neighbors, we just do our thing, go about our life, fairly indifferent to the things of the world. Um, other, other things, uh, uh, this society is noted for a kind of passionless Christendom. We, we are remotely a Christian nation, but it's not really overtly Christian. This kind of low expectation and low involvement. And, and as long as you're a member of a church somewhere, that you're kind of an acceptable citizen of this, of this country. And I'm convinced that with that kind of setting, and as we play a part in that, and this kind of 
part of passionless Christendom that it makes it more difficult rather than easier to ever be the kind of faithful disciple that God would want us to be. Someone says it is easier to become a Christian when I'm not a Christian than to become a Christian when I am one. You understand what he's saying? To kind of live your whole life, just kind of growing up doing Christian things may make it more difficult because you never ever see just kind of passionless Christendom. And then finally, there is an overt, aggressive unbelief that is also a part of our, of our national mindset. Uh, it, it is a little silly in many circles to be a professing Christian. Remember uh, working with uh, one of the members of my uh, doctoral committee at the University of Iowa was a member of the communication department, and she found it unfathomable that I would actually believe that stuff. It's one thing to study religion as a phenomenon, but to, but, but to, to believe what was incredible to her. I mean, she was happy to work with me, but she didn't understand. This couldn't possibly understand. There's an active and aggressive unbelief. Well, I'm suggesting all that to say that we should not be deluded into thinking that, that the world that our children grow up in is a friendly world. It is a world that is hostile to the Christian faith. It is hostile to the Christian faith. Christian faith and the values of this world do not coexist side by side easily. They are always at tension with each other. And if we are not feeling at tension with the world, something is wrong with our faith. If our kids do not understand that, that the world that they are a part of day by day is at odds with the Christian values, there's something wrong in how we're sharing our faith with our kids. That is not to cause them to be elitist in relation to the world. Oh, those poor slobs, they don't know what I know kind of a holier than thou. It, it, it doesn't cause us to, 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 be, to be scared of the world. There is a sense of, of confidence that we face in relation to the world, but we need to know clearly and see clearly what the world is and that the Christian value system is at odds with that world. Uh, the book of 1 Peter is a book specifically about that. It may be the most appropriate book, the most applicable book to, to, to living as a Christian in a, in a pagan world than I know of. But in 1 Peter 4, verse 4, Peter makes a statement, they find it strange that you do not participate in the same flood of dissipation. That little phrase, the world finds it strange that you do not live like them. I'm not sure that we're very much strangers in this world. We will never pass on our faith to our children. Our faith will never have children unless we recognize that we're living as strangers in this world. But let me suggest some counterfeits to, uh, to faith. Some things that, that we construct in the guise of faith, but that is not faith at all. Things that, in my opinion, uh, can be extremely deadly in relation to our children ever having faith of their own. Let me, let me list three or four, and the lesson will be yours today. Number one. For some of us in the church, we are more concerned with the ought to than the why. More than that, for many of us, there's a lot of ought to without the why. It's what would be called moralism. Do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that, live like this, here are the rules, here are the instructions, here are the commands, here are the laws. This is how you should do. This is how you should live. Living by a mere moral code without the why and a sense of, uh, of duty. And as long as we do the right thing, as long as we refrain from certain things, as long as we do certain things, then we are living rightly with God. Holding the right doctrine, then, is the key to salvation. Now, now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that, that doctrine is irrelevant. Doctrine is extremely important. Nor am I saying that it really doesn't matter how you live. Uh, on the contrary, it matters greatly how you live. But to say, this is what you ought to believe, and this is how you ought to act, without giving the why is to create 
a hollow religion that will never make it in the world. All the studies that I have seen concerning what happens to, to, to children who as children were involved in a family that was religious but who grow up not being religious says that this kind of parenting model in church life is the most deadly. A church that is mostly moralistic, a church that sets the strictures and the rule, a church that is hard and harsh about what we do and what we don't do, this is just what we do. We go to church on Wednesday nights. Why? Well, because that's just the way we do it here. Don't ask why. Or the phrase, I want to be careful here because some of you may wear this on, on the bumper stickers of your car. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's just said, it's done, it's what we do, it's what we believe. Now I understand the sentiment of that. But that's, that's, that's not the biblical model. Here are the rules, guys. One, two, three, four, five. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. God never has functioned that way. And children who grow up in that kind of environment are those that are most likely not to be faithful Christians as adults. And the statistics are appalling. It is, it is uh, a, 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 a powerless Christianity. Our Christian values have a why attached to them. I, I, I hinted at this last night. I can be more specific today. Uh, in the Old Testament, 613 laws are given, but the laws never stand by themselves. There's never an ought to without a why. And the why has to do with the story of God and how God has worked in the world, what God has done for us. All of the ought to's have whys. Uh, why, why, uh, why is there a year of jubilee? Why, why every 40 years is there the canceling of debt and the freeing of the slaves? Well, because you were a slave. Because God freed you. And therefore, this is how you should treat each other. The context is always, there's always a story behind the ought to. Some would say that there, uh, there is an, an indicative before there's an imperative. There's a description of who God is before this is what you ought to do. In Paul's epistles, he always begins with the nature of God before he ever says, now, here's the things you ought to do. Here's how you ought to live. This is who God is first. If, if our children don't understand who God is, if there's no why to that, then they will have a, a, a very moralistic religion and it is, it is highly likely that they will not be uh, uh, faithful discipling Christians as, uh, as they grow older. It is a kind of, of legalistic religion where the weightier matters of the law are ignored in order to make sure that the, that the fine points are, are done. It is like the Pharisees who trusted themselves rather than trusting the ways and the works of God. It is the problem of the Galatians that Paul writes to so strongly that they're living a legalistic religion, but within there, there is no faithfulness to the person of God. Moralism will be the death of our children. Not morals, not living good moral lives, but the ought to without the why. Secondly, uh, there is a religion that is filled with feeling, but without the foundation. And, and there's kind of a, kind of a new uh, uh, movement within Churches of Christ in this, uh, in this regard that, that some of us are so tired of kind of old cognitive rationalistic religion where it's all mind and no heart that, that, and we're so desperate to have a heart religion that it becomes all heart and no mind. Feeling without the foundation. We, we need to be excited. We need to experience some things. Uh, sometimes we don't get beyond ourselves and point to Christ, but, but the experience is a thing. Feeling right, feeling good, feeling excited, feeling happy, feeling bright. And we want our assemblies and every other part of our life just to, to make us feel good and feel right. And it, and it is a, a kind of religion that doesn't have the depth and the, and the texture. I know people that in the midst of tragedy, uh, someone dies in a family, and, and, and their first remarks to you in the midst of the tragedy are, oh, well, but you know, God took that person. It'll be fine. All things work together for good. For, for to those that love the Lord, everything's fine, happy. It's, ha it's, a, it's an empty triumphalism that says, says, well, everything in life's good, fine, great, wonderful. Aren't you great? Life's great. You're great. I'm great. 
Why, our, our kids know better than that. I know better. You know better than that. That's not to say that in the midst of a tragic situation, God can't work and won't work for good. That's not to deny that at all. But to say, oh, don't feel sad. Let's be happy. Is, is, is not a, 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 uh, a biblical message that will, that will make much sense, that will carry much depth into the adult years. I, I, I don't know what you're experiencing in the Northwest with that, but I'm finding that in the, the Southwest and, and other places that this, this kind of experiential religion, you know, a happy religion, is, uh, is becoming in vogue, and I think it will not serve our children well either. Thirdly, a counterfeit to real godly faith is religion that has practice without the power. Practice without the power. Kind of a religious piety. Maybe more specifically, a religious propriety. Uh, making sure that things are done in a proper way. Uh, that our worship services are done properly. Let's don't do anything that, that might cause anyone any discomfort here. Let's make sure that everything is done very professionally. Uh, uh, let, let's make sure there's a sense of orderliness here. Uh, get it out on time. Don't make the announcements too long. Don't say anything that will upset anybody. Uh, don't sing any songs that anyone uh, doesn't know. Let's make everyone feel comfortable. Set a nice, quiet, reverent, tone. I can remember as a child at the church that I went to for about a year, there were signs that were placed up at, the, at all the entrances. Uh, quiet, please, as you enter into the auditorium. Well, even as a child, I wanted to say, why? Why? I want, I'm here to see some people. Is that okay? Is it okay to visit? Is it okay to hug? Is it okay to talk? Someone says that, that what our children often learn in our worship services is that God is a grouch. Hush, quiet, be quiet, don't talk, be still, listen, be quiet. Well, that kind of, of propriety, making sure that everything is done right, uh, that, that we're kind of spectators rather than participants. We want our things done well and professionally, speaking in pious language and practices and having a kind of, of, of pious countenance where there is no passion I'm not sure that our assemblies are, 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 ought to be designed so that everyone feels comfortable. I'm not sure that they were originally, and I'm not sure they ought to be here. Something ought to stir us. Something ought to make us think and make us feel what we haven't thought and felt before. That's not to say they ought to be wild and disorderly, but I'm concerned about a religion that, in the words of Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 5, hold to the forms of godliness without the power. And it can be deadly in our families, as our children are exposed to kills them. It kills my soul as well. And finally, a faith that is shape without substance. Shape without substance. Faith by association. To have faith because it's proper to have faith. To have faith because my parents have faith. To have faith because it's the right thing to do. But there is no substance to the faith. William James, the American psychologist at the turn of the century, made the statement that most people's faith is faith in someone else's faith. Faith in my parents' faith, faith in my preacher's faith, faith in my professor's faith, faith in my wife's faith faith in the, in the large community. Did I ask the questions myself? Uh, as, as, a, as a preacher, I, I have often been asked the question by members of my congregation, what, what do we believe about this? You know, what do we believe about that? Or what, what's, what's, our stand on, what's our stand on abortion? Uh, what's, what's our stand on... Uh, 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 you, you name the issue. They want to say, what's our stand What's our stand? Or what do we believe as a church? What do you believe? Do you have any beliefs? Do you think? I don't say that, of course. I'm, I'm much kinder than that. That's what I want to grab by the collar and say, don't you think for yourself? But I won't. I'm, I'm too kind for that. Is, is that what we're perpetuating with our, with our children? Uh, this is what the church has always believed. Let me tell you one of the frightening things. Uh, the, the generation 
largely between age 25 and 35. Ooh, maybe I shouldn't talk like this, but statistics are showing all over the place, not only church, but American society, tends to be there are exceptions in the generation. We just do what we've always done, and we don't want to ask any question why. Don't change anything on us. But you ask them why, and they have no idea. It scares me to death. But for any of us, whatever our age, to have well, just faith, because that's the way we've always been, this is the way we've always done it in the church, is, is a frightening prospect as the years come, because not to know and not to have a faith of our own. Well, what we've, what we've set up today, it, looking at faith in relation to society, which makes, makes faith difficult, and looking at counterfeits for faith, I hope sets us up tomorrow to look at some biblical models. Now, our faith to have children as well as our children to have faith. And then as we do that, I want to make some very specific, practical suggestions about the things that we can do in our homes, the things that we can do in our families, the things that we can do in our churches that can instill that kind of faith in our children. Uh, let, me, let me close with a disclaimer. I am not an expert. I've got three kids, but they're all still at home. I, I, I'm not sure even if they grow up to be faithful that I can accept the, the, the credit for that. And if they grow up and they do things that I'm not proud of, I'm not sure that I can bear all the responsibility for that either. I'm not an expert. I'm not going to give you a bunch of quick, easy things to do. No techniques. But I do believe that if we have ourselves in the church a passionate, deep, aggressive, sacrificial faith and surround our children in the community, in our homes, and nurture them, there is a much greater chance that our children, when they grow to adults, will themselves be faithful. May God be with you.